Okay, well, I will continue then. I hope you hear me on the back sides. So today I will be talking about USB libraries we have in Rust, which are mostly about USB devices and em embedded USB devices in particular. And well, maybe my first question would be how many of you did any USB, made any USB devices? Okay, quite a nice amount. So for the rest maybe, or like in general, I will go through some USB basics on, on a single page, but yeah. So USB is a relatively simple protocol. It has USB hosts and devices concepts, and hosts are kind of the main component here which initiates all the transfers and we also have USB hubs to multiply the number of devices we can connect to a single host. And also USB has some terms like device classes and composite devices and composite devices usually a device which contains multiple classes and the class may be anything like a human interface device which is a keyboard or a sound card or flash drive or whatever, so you may have multiple of them, especially if you have some complex device like an SD card reader plus Ethernet plus HDMI or something. So here things go more complex than usual. And on the very basic limit, on the very basic level, communication is performed via so-called endpoints, which are kind of sockets in a way, and we have a, a limited number of endpoints in each device. So when hosts want to send or read the data, it communicates to a specific endpoint of a device, which is numbered. And a good thing about USB is that it tries to simplify and to reduce the amount of data we need to transfer to simplify protocols. And it achieves this by separating descriptors and raw data. So. Most USB devices communicate in beforehand or over some like generic protocols what they do support, which is called descriptor, and then when the host needs to communicate to the device, it uses data of a known protocol and it doesn't have to support complex things like TLV or JSON or whatever else. So descriptor basically tells what to expect from this device and how it it is supposed to be used. And on the physical level, USB is just two lines at least, up to high speed USB. It's just D plus, D minus, half duplex, which basically means that you cannot send and receive at the same time. So the overall bandwidth you have is divided between in and out transactions. And we have different speed grades, low speed, which is I guess extremely uncommon nowadays, and I don't really know if there are even devices on sale. And there are full speed devices, which are most microcontrollers, if they support USB. There are high speed devices, which, is, which are like high grade devices at this point, like flash drives, which require more speed, or Ethernet things, and some microcontrollers as well, when they have a lot of capacity. And yeah, nowadays we have also super speed which is even faster and there are multiple ways to do it. So overall the USB communication works on different levels of abstraction and we have this highest function la layer which like for example a disk device which has communicated to it as a, as a disk or as sector reads and so on, and then we have lower, lower layers, but the actual communications happens on, at the lowest layer. So all the transactions between different layers are just translated by software. So in the end, you have only these bits on the wire. And well, from these bits, it may be really difficult to tell what's going on because you need to know the whole protocol from the bottom to the top. But this simplifies everything. So when we develop USB devices, we, we are mainly interested in the lowest layer because if it works, then you can do everything. And as I said, USB communication is 
global via USB endpoints, and each device may have up to 16 endpoints in each direction. So if you need something bidirectional, you need to use two different endpoints. And endpoints may have different types. So the most basic type is control endpoint, which is also used for device information, for descriptor getting, for some control to turn off or reset the device or something like that. And it is also used for some functions, for really simple functions. And this is usually this DFU, which is even standardized. So this is device firmware upgrade and some other firmware upgrade protocols as well. And it is also widely used for custom vendor commands. So if some vendor decides to implement its own device, it may also use these basic endpoints because they are simple. Then we have bulk endpoints, and bulk endpoints are often used in situations when we need, need reliable communication and when, for example, some request fails, we need to retry this request so the data is not lost. And like the most common example of this is flash drives. These are using bulk endpoints. Then we have interrupt endpoints, which are mostly used for some slow polling things and, for example, for keyboards, mice, gamepads, game which just report that some buttons are pressed or released and so on. And then we have the most complex thingy, which is isochronous endpoints, which these endpoints are used for predictable but not reliable communication because when you want to make something really predictable, you can't make it reliable. And this predictability means that you always have some bandwidth which is allocated in beforehand and you also guarantee that the requests will be executed at the same time compared to each other. So the latency will be roughly the same between requests. And this is important for some streaming things like web cameras and audio devices. Then we have Rust. USB ecosystem, which sort of separates different concepts. And if you have a firmware which implements a USB device, then it, is, it often uses some HAL for an MCU, which is hardware abstraction layer to implement some basic components like UR drivers, clock configuration, and so on. And USB related components, and the most important component here is USB device, which is a central crate which serves as a base for both USB drivers and USB classes. USB drivers are MCU-specific components which know how to communicate to a specific USB peripheral and how to implement different types of endpoint transactions. And then USB classes know nothing about hardware. Instead, they know which descriptors to present and how many endpoints they need, how to translate data sent to these endpoints into something useful. So for example, if you have USB serial, we translate all the requests on endpoints into some stream of bytes. And all the requests are packets and since we are, we are implemented serial port, we need to convert packets into bytes and vice versa. So this kind of, of translation happens in classes. And how it was roughly five years ago, we had USB device crate, and then we had one driver, which was for STM3203, and then we had one class, which is USB serial, and all these libraries were implemented by a single person, which is here. <laughs> but what we have now? Now the situation is much better. I don't know how this happened, but probably it was so good that people started to implement some drivers and classes. And device drivers cover quite a lot of popular microcontrollers. So we have two device drivers for STM32 microcontrollers, which has completely different peripherals. Then we have for NRF 52, then we have for the, the newest Raspberry Pi 
2040, and so on and so on. And there are also a lot of USB classes, like heat class, which can be used for keyboards. There is even a complete project of a keyboard written in Rust, which uses this. And then we have classes for storage, have classes for this. Oh, we have two heat classes. Okay, good. <laughs> Very useful class, yes, indeed. We even have web USB class, which implements a really interesting concept when you can control your USB device from the browser, modern browsers. Well, I don't know, maybe even Firefox nowadays support this, but this is really convenient sometimes when you want to simplify life for your user. You can just implement some website and then connect this website to your device. Implement automatic firmware update, whatever you need. And, well, it was surprising, but USB device has 101 reverse dependencies. So quite a lot of crates nowadays use it. These are project crates, HAL crates, and these device drivers, USB classes, yeah. And how it, what it takes to make a USB driver, for example, I will just go quickly through this to, to make you understand roughly what, what it takes. So when you have just a microcontroller and you don't have a driver for this microcontroller or you, you have your FPGA stuff, something that is not supported yet. So first thing you want to do is to make, it, make the host detect your device. Sometimes you may have a board where it is already implemented because you have a pull-up resistor or something like that. So when you just connect your board head, host already tries to detect your device and show some errors in DMASK, for example, but when you have a normal peripheral, you don't need to do this, so usually when you connect your device, host doesn't see anything and it doesn't track, it doesn't try to initialize your device or read something from it. So first you're trying to enable this peripheral and make it somehow be detected by the host and then some basic things like USB reset handling happen because USB reset resets the internal state, so it is important to handle it first. And then there is enumeration process, and enumeration process is more or less reading descriptors from the device. So you need to support endpoint zero, which is control endpoint, so to this endpoint should provide some information. Usually all the information you need at this point is already provided by the USB device crate, but it should be somehow transferred to the endpoint on the lower layer, because USB device doesn't know anything about hardware. And here, like, an interesting thing to do is to try to enumeration without any classes. So it's just an empty device which has PID, VID, things like that, like generic name because this way all the descriptors will feed into 64 byte packet. So it is a relatively easy task and when you start filling this device with some classes then it becomes larger and larger and sometimes it just doesn't fit into the internal buffer. It happens. Then USB full speed devices for example support 64 byte packets and 8 byte packets for this endpoint and of course if you set it to 8 bytes then the whole report doesn't fit already and you have to do something so bugs happen at this point then there are truncated P0 transactions like the host says I want 64 bytes from you and then after the first 8 bytes it, it says like stop stop I don't need anymore. This is a really weird condition for example on the NRF microcontrollers, it seems that there is no good way to handle it because, well, maybe creators of it didn't think thoroughly that this situation may happen, but Linux does this every time. You can trust that this will be broken if you don't think about it. And then when the control endpoints are more or less implemented, you can start implement all the other endpoint types. They are a bit different, so some type specific implementation may be needed. And for isochronous endpoints, some 
complex synchronization may be needed as well, but this is probably leaves in a class implementation. So on each stage here, you may face some bugs and it may be really difficult to debug these bugs. So I'm going to discuss how to handle this. As for the debugging, we have multiple options. Some of them are free, some of them are not. But the most basic option as GDB is really useless because when you try to debug something in GDB, you are usually setting a breakpoint or, or on something and then and you set this breakpoint, then USB stops working. Because USB works in terms of frames, which happen one mill each millisecond on slow USB and some microseconds on faster USB. So when you even stop for a brief while, the whole USB device most likely stops working after that. So enumeration fails, for example, and it will not retry. So garbage. Then we have Wireshark, and Wireshark is not only able to sniff traffic on your network card, but it also has possibility to capture USB requests. But the thing is that it captures it on the very high level from the operating system, and it is mostly useful when you have a protocol problem, not a low-level problem. So at the very, f the very first stages of development, this is quite useless, well, but it is free. Then we have the most important tool here is logic analyzers. Logic analyzer is a dedicated hardware which can gather bits from your wires. And usually the thing is that you can store quite a lot of data before you analyze this data. So for example, logic analyzers which I show Later, these are capable of storing data in real time, so you can store as much data as you can fit on your hard drive or SSD. Quite unlimited possibilities. And this is quite important because in this case, you see almost the full picture of what happens with your USB device. The only thing you do not see is what happens inside your device, but it's a bit different story. One software way to trace USB might be to use eBPF filters in kernel. So you can you can attach like for basically for any symbol or kernel function these small eBPF programs that you can use like way more way more low latency to trace stuff such as USB traffic. Yeah, so. this might work, but again, I am not sure if you will be able to gather enough low-level information because this information may disappear already when it enters hardware you are analyzing. Okay. okay. Your PC, you may not see a packet because it is lost due to some CRC reasons, for example. Okay. So if CRC fails, you may not see it at all in the Linux kernel. So. Well, I don't know. Yeah, this should provide better yeah. granularity than Wireshark. Yeah, but yeah it's, it, it, it's at, at least should be better than Wireshark. Yeah, it, even if, if it should perfect. be better for sure. Yeah. By the way, do you know any tools which implement this approach already? Like no, easy to use tools? No, I, 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 I do Linux kernel professionally, so I just use this tool called BPS Trace when I need to debug kernel bugs. So I don't know. I I I actually checked like like recently that there's a, there's a Rust crate that you can use to to create these BP, eBPF filters for for the kernel, but I haven't tried that yet. Yeah, but then you need to understand what exactly you want to hook. So yeah, 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 yeah. That's, kind that's, of that's level true. Level. That's true because it's like like ever chasing tar target. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But yeah, quite quite an interesting approach. At least it can be developing developed into a tool one day. I hope to see it. Yes. As for the logic analyzers, I, I think I I have said anything everything. So. And we have another approach for trying to investigate what's going on inside the microcontroller, which is more or less tracing or printf debugging or whatever you call it. 
and there we, we have UART, we have RTT and DFMT. I will discuss this a bit later. So as for the logic analyzers, I'm not aware of all the logic analyzers, but these are probably the most common options apart from the last one. The first one is relatively expensive, but it is really good and it is capable of quite a good speed. So you will definitely be able to get all the USB communication with quite a good precision. And it also promised like eight channels, but this is not completely true because with 100 mega samples per second, you can only sniff up to three channels. And if you need more, then the speed will be lower because everything is bounded by the USB 2.0 speed, which is not super great, but there are other options like Logic 16, which uses USB 3.0, so it should be faster, but it is damn expensive. I wouldn't recommend it if you just need to debug USB. And most of the logic analyzers are based on Cypress FX2 chip, which is kind of data to USB stuff. It implements a FIFO in its basic implementation. And for example, in logic, we get data from pins through FPGA and FPGA feeds some really fast stream of data towards Cypress and Cypress stream this over USB. Have quite a lot of bandwidth there. And this device also supports ADC, so you can measure some analog signals, but the speed will not be 100 megahertz, of course, because that's even more data. Then we have clones, and these clones are quite good, and sometimes they are quite simple. So for example, the clone of the very old logic analyzer, which is just Cilea Logic, it is cheap, and it provides like 24 mega samples per second, eight channels at the same time, and based on more or less the same hardware, except there is no FPGA, there is no ADC, it just, it is, suitable only for digital signals. These 24 mega samples per second is maximum, and the problem is that this is what you really need for USB, because for USB is 12 megahertz, and if you go below that, you will not be able to capture any USB traffic at all, or at least decode it. And the problem with this is that if you have any web camera or some fast device like hard drive or something like that running on the same root hub, you will not be able to achieve this speed because this speed pushes the device to its maximum bandwidth, basically. So you need a really, really free root hub in order to use it at the max speed. But, well, if you have a laptop, for example, you can connect a logic analyzer to a laptop and then everything else to a PC, something like that. Then we have Logic 16 clone, which is capable of 100 MSPS, costs a little bit more, and it has also 16 channels, which are also a bit fake because you cannot use all 16 at this speed. But still, you can use at least three at this speed for sure, and the idea is pretty much the same. You have the Cypress FX2 plus FPGA to handle different number of channels at different speeds. Then we have DS logic. I don't really know anything about it, but it is a bit better in a way that apart from FPGA, they also have memory. So it is capable of streaming or at least capturing streams which are much faster than USB. So it just remembers this data to memory at some limited amount and then reports this to PC. So it's just the same thing, but with a huge cache. And we have a specialized device, which is called Luna, or it was for some reason renamed to Suntion. It is capable of analyzing USB high speed, which is quite rare. And usually if you have a production device, which is capable of analyzing USB high speed, it is really expensive. None of the logic analyzers above is, are capable of analyzing this USB speed. But this device is, so it is basically based on FPGA plus USB high-speed files. 
and it has four USBs. I'm not sure if you are able to use all four, but still for analysis purposes, three should be enough. Yeah, it can be currently pre-ordered on current crowd supply. I'm not sure if they are going to ship it, but the date which is said there is 31st of January this year. Who knows, maybe this will be the final one, but I don't know. Cannot promise anything because it's a crowd supply. As for the logic analyzer software, the situation is pretty poor, I would say, because we have official software from CLE, which is proprietary, but it can be extended with some plugins, like decoder plugins, which is not useful for USB in, the, in this scenario, but it also has a decoder for USB, and this decoder is quite bad, I would say, because sometimes it just fails to achieve a lock on the data it fetches, even if this data is fetched at the very high speed, like maximum possibilities, but then it fails to acquire a lock and the decoded data is just wrong. But it, it is capable of exporting to VCD format or some other binary formats, and these formats can be imported to the second software option we have. And this software option is open source, it's called Sigrock. This Sigrock is like a base library which supports multiple logic analyzers and pulls you as a graphical user interface for it. So you can use it directly with the probes which support this, so which are supported by this software, for example, all the clones and some generic FX2 boards. And yeah, there is also an option if you want to use proprietary software for capturing, then you can export data from proprietary software and use it in the open source software. Not so convenient, but the second option works great for USB and it shows you it all the transactions in different details, so you can choose whether you need very low level representation or the highest level when you have requests. Yeah, also I noticed that the latest version of the official logic software for some reason doesn't support exporting to VCD anymore. I remember that 1.x supports, and I checked this, but 2.x for some reason doesn't support supports CSV and some binary format, that's it. But yeah, it can be converted of course into VCD or something suitable for SIGROC. And then we have tracing. There are multiple options in the Rust ecosystem. The first one, the oldest one, which is called semi-hosting. Semi-hosting is a mechanism to like fire an interrupt or a halt instruction inside the microcontroller and let the debugger grab the data to the outside world. Semi-hosting is quite good in a way that you can work even with files on your host PC, but from the microcontroller. But it is really, really slow. And if you try to just send some bytes over it, it will be super slow. It, it is not suitable for debugging it. U of USB and I would think that with modern approach you shouldn't use it at all and don't let anyone use it. Like friends don't let friends use semi-hosting. Then we have UART which is quite a simple approach, you just send some bytes to it. But UART is slow but this is not the main problem because the amount of data may be not so big. The bigger problem is that sometimes you need to send a lot of data but in small chunks. So you have spikes in required performance of your CPU. And this is a big problem because often drivers are quite simple and a lot of CPU power is just consumed to send in bytes towards UART. Unless you have DMA or something fancy like on NRF52 which can send something transparently out of the UART this will not work. And then we finally have RTT. RTT is a thing, I think, which comes from J-Link adapters and it was initially for the C language, but in, in the Rust ecosystem we can have native things. So 
This may work with any adapter, not only J-Link, but whatever you want, like ST-Link, and with Rust, of course. The idea behind RTT is to offload data transfer to the debugger. So instead of sending something to the peripheral, like in case of UART, you just store this data in memory and wait until debugger grabs this data. But you don't wait right away, you just wait asynchronously when there is no space, for example. Or you can discard all data if there is no space. There are choices. But the most important thing is that it doesn't wait until the whole package is transmitted to the outside world. Instead, you connect your debugger to the chip, and this debugger pulls your memory, pulls your ring buffer for this data, and grabs when you, there is something new in this ring buffer. So this is really cheap, especially when your chip supports reading memory without stopping the core. That this is the main way you can use it efficiently, actually, because if you stop the core for each reduction, then what is the difference? And, well, this works, but this still requires some CPU cycles for formatting, especially if you have floating point values for some reason in USB debugging, then this is terribly slow. So, people invented DefMT. DefMT is the idea of having formatting implemented on host instead of the device. So rather than formatting your format string on the device, you just send pointers to this format string and send all the data required for formatting, but don't do the formatting itself. This is even faster, but this requires some tooling on the outside of the firmware and well, this is doable. This has some problems sometimes when, for example, protocol version in the firmware doesn't match the protocol version of the software on your PC, but still, if you really want to use it, you can use it, and this is quite convenient way to debug and also the most efficient so far. What about testing? So, for example, you implemented something already. It kind of works, but you are not still sure that it works fully. Or, for example, you have a driver and someone makes some modifications to this driver and you want to make sure that it still works correctly in all of the cases. So regression testing is the number one goal here, especially if there is a driver that supports multiple microcontrollers. If you add support for just one new, you still have to test all the others. And also for peripheral driver testing in general. So if you add something, some functionality to it. But what is not covered yet is class testing because different classes are different and it's quite difficult to arrange some generic way of testing classes. So in general, I suppose that whoever implements a class they are responsible for testing this class at least on one microcontroller to make sure that it works somehow. The first thing we can use here to test our USB device implementation is the test class, so-called, provided by the USB device create itself. This class implements multiple endpoints which are only used for testing and it consists of both the firmware side and the host engine side. The firmware side is simplified to a, like two function calls, I suppose. The first one is to create this device and another one to pull this device. Quite simple to implement for any hardware if you have enough support for USB there. And the host agent is an application which runs all the tests. And there are a lot of tests there. So, well, as I said, yes, we allocate endpoints of all the different types to, to verify that they are successfully allocated, that the parameters of these endpoints are the same as supposed to be in the device implementation. There are also string descriptors which are tested not only for different interfaces, but also, I think, for different languages because USB supports this, why not to test it? 
And there are also transfer testing when we send data towards endpoint or receive data from an endpoint to verify that data transfer works and also different corner cases for transfer sizes are checked, which is very important because it may work, for example, if the packet is small, but then break if the packet is large enough. And also it measures bulk transfer bandwidth. So this may be useful to see if you have any performance regressions, for example. You can measure this bandwidth before and after the test. And also useful to compare it to the theoretical maximum, which is provided in the USB spec. Then we have a, quite a simple interrupt test, and the reason behind this test is that sometimes interrupts are not handled properly. So when interrupt happens, you can call a function to handle this interrupt from the library, but then it will not handle it completely, for example, because implementer forgot something about different interrupt aspects, and this interrupt will fire again. And this test basically tests that when we first upload the firmware to the device, the interrupt doesn't fire more than 10 times in a row. Because nothing happens, it shouldn't fire constantly. And then there is a quite an interesting test, just a serial benchmark, but it is a stress test in a way, because it tries to send as much data as possible toward the device and device acts like a regular serial port, but it echoes all the data back, but in uppercase. This test may not be trivial for the initial implementation because sometimes multiple requests may arrive one after another, and sometimes due to some bugs, you will not be able to handle one of them, and then the whole packet is lost. So this test also verifies that all the data it sends is received back correctly. So no lost packets there, and the data itself is as expected. This test catches quite a lot of bugs. It's amazing how a simple test can find so many bugs. Then we have an interesting story. For some reason with this test, USB 3.0 ports lead to worse performance than USB 2.0 ports with the same device, with the same firmware. The reason is that as all the transfers happen within one frame, and one frame for slow devices is one millisecond, within one frame and 64 bar transfers, you can have only 18 transfers. And USB 3.0 ports use different polling pattern. For example, USB 2.0 ports for this test use like read, write, read, write, read, write. In this case, microcontroller is able to handle all the packets because all the writes arrive with some gap between them. But with 3.0 ports, some write, write operation can happen right after another, and in this case, if double buffering doesn't work or it is not implemented fully, then one of the write operations will fail. And due to the nature of USB, it is more expensive to fail a write operation toward the device than to fail a read operation towards host, because during read operation, there is a small request which says, I want to read, and then you said, I have no data. But when you do write operation, you write all the data, and then microcontroller says, no, I cannot handle it. So you waste all the 64-byte packet just because microcontroller is not able to reply at the very beginning. That's how the protocol works. And in this test in general, in one frame, around one to two out requests just fail with the snack because microcontroller is not able to handle this amount of data. Another reason with USB 3.0 that some bugs manifest only with these parts. For example, current implementation of USB OTG with high speed devices, it just fails the test completely when you plug the device into 3.0 port. Works fine in 2.0. 
there are some bugs. So my recommendation here is if you are trying to debug your device and to understand why something doesn't work, plug it first to the 2.0 port. If it works there, then yeah, this is a separate story, but it would be much, much easier to reproduce a bug if you will not face any additional problems related to 3.0. But of course, when everything is ready and you want to do additional testing, then you can use it. It will introduce problems for sure. And then we have the final test, which is called Official USB Compliance Test Chapter 9. There are some other chapters as well, but this is like the most generic and it applies to all the devices. So you can plug your device and then run all the tests. And the most important thing about this test is that it checks all the dark corners of the USB stack. Well, not, not all maybe because there are some class specific issues which can be found of course, but at least if you forgot something which is really rare or seems to be unimportant, it, it will find it. This tool runs only on Windows and it generates a nice test report and if something fails, most likely it will say why it failed. And if your device is really, really bad, like a programmer based on a RISC-V chip which emulates FT232, then this programmer USB device may even crash this compliance test. That's a nice thing. Uh, I've never seen the device which is so bad that it not only fails, but it crashes the test software. <coughs> For some reason nowadays it is really hard to find a 2.0 com compatible software on the official website. It was there previously, but nowadays there I am at, at 3.0 and this version for some reason just doesn't work with all devices and like simple devices based on microcontrollers. So good luck finding an old one, but you can mail me, I will send you an exe file. <laughs> Another important thing about this test is that it interacts with the device on a very low level and in order to achieve this, it hijacks control over the root hub. And when it does it, basically no other devices work on your USB root hub. And if you have a simple computer set up with a USB keyboard and a simple root hub, then this USB keyboard just becomes disconnected. This is not a fatal issue in a way because there is a safety, how to say, safety startup procedure which allows you to roll back everything. If you do not press the button, okay, now everything works, then it will just disconnect from the root hub and everything starts working. But it is indeed a, an issue when you want to use this tool. So the only way I think to use it on a regular PC is to have multiple root hubs and somehow know which root hub corresponds to which port and then use only this port for testing and only this root hub. But another option is to use a laptop because often laptops implement PS2 keyboards or their emulation which are not USB keyboards. So at least keyboard works after that or touchpad or something like that. Yeah, you had oh, I think an easy way is to use remote desktop. Sorry? Remote desktop. So you connect like remotely to your Windows Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. Yeah, good point. No, no USB required. <laughs> yeah, but then you still need two PCs. <laughs> but yeah, this is possible yes, for sure. But that's not, nowadays having two PCs is not so uncommon, I think. Yeah. So yeah, this tool is nice, but there are some limitations and sometimes it is difficult to use it. That's how it looks like. There is a window and there is a list of tests. By default, all the tests are selected. You just run the test suite and it reports something. So it marks a test green if it's passed, it marks a test red if it's failed, and so on. All the test suite is passed like in a minute or two. There is one test which is really long, which does like 200 enumerations in a row <laughs> to verify that your device will not die after this. But 
Yeah, this takes quite a while, but all other tests are really simple in, in a way that they are fast, so you can iterate testing again and again. Yeah, but everything is good, but what's next? So testing complex device drivers is really tedious, so when you have a driver which supports multiple microcontrollers or multiple peripherals, and you want to add another one, then how to test that no regressions happened. For example, the biggest driver, I guess, so far, this Synopsys USB Autogev, supports eight peripheral versions and three PHY types, internal one, internal two, and external PHY. And you need to have all the hardware, ideally, to make sure that it still works. But at least some tests can be automated. So for example, USB device test class is a completely automated test. If something fails, it just returns an error code and that's it. Then serial benchmark can be automated too. I'm not sure if it fails if something goes wrong, but it should be really easy to make it fail. And then we have these chapter nine tests, which are just bad because it's a Windows program. You can run it on Linux and so on. So there are some ways to improve. The first way is to test multiple devices roughly at the same time by just switching between these, these devices. They already have a prototype for this idea which consists of a switch and control board, which is sort of a main board into which daughter boards with MCUs are inserted. So these boards implement switching. We are starting to uh, run out of time, so uh, no if, yeah, I mean, like to start. Yep. So yeah, so the idea is just to switch between these devices, and on this specific board, the switch is implemented in a way that only one reset is deasserted at the at the same point of time, and all the other signals are just combined. For slow USB devices, it should work, and in fact, it works. And then you test one device and then deassert another device and test this device and so on. Just run all the tests in a loop over all the devices. And then it would be a really, really good idea to implement all the chapter nine tests as a separate device or at least as a software component, which can run these tests on Linux or somehow automated without any need to press buttons and so on. This requires, of course, some reverse engineering and yeah, host implementation is needed if we need to implement this as a separate device. Yeah, but that's it I wanted to tell you. So if you have any questions, please ask.